some of what I thought I covered, which was um, if 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 you just think of your breath as inhalation and exhalation, if you just like think of the oxygen coming in and coming out, that's that's how your mind experiences your breath more without practice because that's where movement and change is introduced. And it's easier for your mind to track movement and change, right? So part of what I was trying to say is that when you kind of too quickly, kind of like when you try to do a yoga pose and just muscle it, right? That aware breath awareness, if it's just keyed into the easiest part, which is the movement, right? Where the inhalation and exhalation happen, where there's sound and where there's an object for your mind to actually grip onto that that um that's the easy part of your breath and that the breath cycle is way deeper than that and one of the things we were trying to explore was the kind of giving sense to okay if it's not just keyed into what's moving and easily tangible right how is it the BKS Ender Anger might say something like, like, um, like every cell breathes. Right. So if you're just keyed into your inhalation and exhalation, it's really hard and about the amount of oxygen that's happening. Right. Like, how would every cell breathe? Okay, because right, so. How is it and what things are you doing in yoga poses? Is Angelique on the call, by the way? I can't, I don't know if she's on this class. But how is it that um, that you can get your whole body to participate in breathing? Even when you're sitting still. And so we juxtapose that with, with um, the idea that when the from Bhikkhu Sangar, his translation of a key passage of the sutras, <clears throat> um, when effortful effort becomes effortless, you've encountered the fourth method of pranayama. Okay, so we've got again, let me try to put these two back together cuz like how is it that every cell breathes right that that when effortful effort becomes effortless you've encountered the fourth method of pranayama where the first three are inhalation exhalation <clears throat> and and the retention between the two right and then he's saying something in addition to that. When effortful effort becomes effortless, you've encountered the fourth method of pranayama. Okay. So we got a conundrum, right? We got a paradox happening, right? Like what, how, what, what? So Angelique, you're on the call? Yes. So Angelique brought up something in Team Adaptables that I'm, so I'm trying to highlight the class, but so, because like Angelique and I've come from slightly different, slightly kind of different backgrounds on pranayama and breathing. And okay, I love, I love using, using Angelique as my, you know, the, the other side of this, right. And, and so one of the things that's, you know, she comes more from a vinyasan background, which is really, really a beautiful way of doing it. And I'm all, but part of the thing that vinyasan does is just integration of any breath and movement. So it's going to be cued into the breathing side of it more. I mean, the movement side of it more. Which when you think about when you're doing series of poses and you're breathing, then the movement and the blood flow make sure that all the blood is touching the entire body through the movement. So you're actually breathing into your entire body, 
right, by having the, the blood be the carrier of the inhalation and exhalation part, right? So it's from, a, from having every cell breathe, right? Part of the wisdom of that, of that tradition or approach more is that, um, <clears throat> that, that, uh, that the blood flow is getting it all over the entire body. Okay. Is anybody following me right now? Got a whole bunch of balls in the air. Should I back up again and try to say it again? Okay. Right. So we're trying to figure out because what I, what I wanted to get across it last week was that without intimidating your mind too much, breathing is a gigantic field. Pranayama is a gigantic field of realization. In fact, I remember a senior Anga teacher had traveled all around some ashrams asking all different ashram leaders, if you could only do a couple of your one yoga posts for the rest of your life, what would it be? And they all smack, he says, they, they all smacked him on the head and said, Pranayama, stupid. Right. So, so, right. So, knowing that on some level, if you, you know, breathing obviously is more important than moving your body, not only for your survival, but, but, um, but maybe even on the path of realization. So that being said, um, I'm trying to get across what is it that we can do if we're not as, as able to move in as, because remember pranayama is typically taught when it's just taught as pranayama, pranayama is typically taught stationary okay you're you know you can do walking meditation and stuff but usually pranayama is taught stationary except when the vinyasin approach because they teach pranayama too but like when the vinyasin approach is getting the movement to circulate the blood to every cell so every cell is breathing through blood flow okay so so you've got like, how is it when you're stationary that you can get it so your every cell is breathing, right? So, and I was trying to say, trying to bring it, every cell is breathing and how is it that you can make effortful effort effortless to get the entire body breathing? Right. So like, for example, one of any of you have ever had any body work, for example. Right. Um, and they they tell you to they're pushing on a point and they say, breathe into that. Right. And so often you try to push your inhalation there. And that that would be one level. Right. Or you don't even have to have body work. It doesn't have to be that. Maybe someone's like helped you work out a, 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 a real tight spot on your body. So, so like, for example, when someone, you got a really tight spot in your body and someone pushes on it, you could breathe into that like force or, or you, you could feel, you know how you get a certain point and at first it hurts, but then you feel kind of a, sensation of relief cascade around your body do you know what i'm talking about here nod your head if you know what i'm talking about right you kind of go oh wow okay how do you breathe into that the cascading light so if you think about a tight muscle it's pulled some of your prana and centralized it right into a knot and then all of a sudden something comes to get it to release. And all of a sudden you start feeling lighter and you feel release. 
and there's the physical muscle that's releasing, but then there's a sensation around the physical muscle that somehow you're going, oh my God, I've been squeezing the world too tight, right? And I didn't even know it. And so how do you breathe into that secondary awareness that's more full-bodied because someone helped you release a knot of prana? Is this making sense to anybody? Can somebody? Yeah, okay, so... Last week, I was trying to explore this, right? Did Angelique hide from the class again? She's off my screen again. Oh, there she is. So, so, all right. So if that's making some sense, and we can kind of go through some of it, because obviously I'm revisiting this because there's a lot of deep things going on in what I'm trying to share. Right. It's a it's a recognition of the full breath cycle and the role that the body plays in it. So one of the things that happened in the after talk, in the after times, was some really interesting questions about well, what about complicated breathing techniques and how do you not over grip stuff? And People are talking about when you try to do these techniques, you try to over, you end up over gripping your diaphragm. And all these things were happening in the, in the after hour talk that, that are all really good things. Like, how do you stay open? And I was asking questions. Now, remember, I'm stringing beads. You don't have to follow everything right now. Why would you do Shavasana as pre preparation for a pranayama practice? Like, what's going on? Why is the equal distribution of presence? and the surrender of your weight. I was asking things like, why is your chest lifted when you're doing pranayama? How does it relate to these things I was just saying about every cell breathes, effortless effort being effortless, right? So isn't it funny Then there's wisdom to not realizing all this and just breathing and moving that's part of what's brilliant about it because because once your mind starts to become aware of all the pieces it can be overwhelming is anyone overwhelmed now with all that i'm saying right yeah you know what's great the other thing i was trying to say last week is that there is no such thing really i don't believe as pranayama knowledge there's only pranayama practice Right. You can kind of learn how to do the techniques and what the techniques are. But this field is so vast, it's only going to give back to you if you practice. Right. That's how you learn stuff. So it's hard to teach pranayama because you're just kind of facilitating people's breaths without really knowing what's going on in them. All right. So, Catherine, you had your hand up. <laughs> I just lowered it. The thing about this is that that last week's class was very, very deep and profound for me. Mm -hmm. And what this brings up is the whole question of how much control and deliberateness do I have about things like uh, my breath or anything else? So... One of the things is that, and this is part of what I wanted to try to get across a little bit last week too, is that on various ways, right, was that, that if the ultimate goal is to integrate your mind in your breathing practice because you actually believe that something is optimized when that occurs, that's an assumption, you know what I mean? I think it's probably right, All right? So, so like when you start to actually become more and more aware of the breath, your breath tends to suffer. Right. Right. And, and so in a way, right, <clears throat> becoming too aware of all the components of it can also be a hindrance. Right. But then you start to realize that something you took for granted when when breath is maintained as an unconscious process. 
you don't have to confront the interaction between breath and mind, right? You don't have to do it as much. When you start to try to pull a, a, apart that sticky, that knot, right? Then all of a sudden you start to realize that your breath does not very often non-violently integrate. Your mind is not often not interrupt or non-violently integrate with your breathing process. And that that balance between the two parts of these two parts of human consciousness is incredibly difficult. Okay. So, and it takes a lot of practice. So, but then, you know, maybe it's not worth all the attention. So one of the things I was saying last week was that, was that thinking about pranayama as breath control, like you're supposed to control your breath and become victorious over your breath and learn all these techniques and whatever, might not, in my opinion, that sounds, doesn't it sound like I, I have to be careful saying things like this in this type of um, configuration, but doesn't that sound super male and patriarchal? You're supposed to freaking control your breath, win it become victorious. There's a whole bunch of things in Indian philosophy that sounds to me like a bunch of male guys sitting in a room trying to impose their view of, of, of maleness on the, the underlying mystery, mysterious fabric of the universe. So it strikes me as a little bit odd. So one of the times, one of the things that I heard from a teacher, not a vinyasan teacher, by the way, right? was that he thought that, this is Richard Freeman, he thought that, that, um, that, that pran breath control is a poor translation of pranayama. That he thought that a better translation was of the Sanskrit, was removing the impediments to breathing, which typically is the mind, right? So the mind has to trans transform from judger to pure observer. And one of the places where that becomes exceptionally difficult is in relationship to breath. Anyone getting worn out by all the words yet? I can see, I can see all the, oh God. All right, so Jane, Worn out by the words. I know it's early in the morning out there, but say, say more about, you know, like what would help now? Some movement. Some movement? Mm -hmm. Back to the wisdom of vinyasan, right? Yeah, so why, why would you move as preparation for pranayama? To, um, to integrate well as a preparation yeah um, I'm not sure maybe to quiet in the mind or at least get it unstuck out of a rut yeah yeah, yeah. give it give the mind yeah. Give the mind something to do so that. But but often it's best, and this is where we're that we're exploring pranayama, right? Mm -hmm. Words make it tough. A certain kind of listening makes pranayama tough, mm -hmm. right? But usually pranayama is best done either right when you wake up or right when you go to bed, when you're not moving. When you're not awakened like that, except I totally, especially online, I totally get why you'd want to have some movement, right? Right? Because we're going to have to, right? Because the words just are falling dead on the flat screen, right? Which I completely agree with. All right. So some movement would help. All right. So just for a second, rock back and forth and do the things you need. I'll be right back.
So tell me, as you moved a little bit, going to keep Jane under the bus now, right? What did that accomplish? Because I believe it accomplished something. I'm not yeah, asking a false question. I'm it believing dropped, it accomplished it, something. It dropped my listening. My listening. My While you've been talking, my focus has been like up in my head, right? And I've been like listening, listening, except I have been moving a little bit. So when the talking stopped and I just started to move, I, my mind dropped into my body. So you got more body presence. Yeah. And it so powered. why would typically, and this is like, these are like good thoughts. Why typically would that preparation for a pranayama class happen with Shavasana as opposed to movement? Because you've done your movement. Have you? Usually pranayama is done before you practice. So you, okay. Because in my experience, pranayama has been done after practice, after shavasana, then pranayama. You do it after a full asana class? Mm -hmm. That'd be a, a, a difference in technique, right? Okay. A lot of times I, I when I, I often teach it that way just because it's easier to do when you're in person, right? right? But if you're if you're practicing at home, I wouldn't typically practice too much before you do pranayama. Okay, right? but you yeah, do but shavasana? but that's that's more of the method I'm trained in. I mean, you you and know, you do shavasana and then pranayama. Well, typically, yeah. But I like what you're saying. See, I this is what I'm trying to get at. Like what you're saying is that is that in a way by moving your body a little bit, mm -hmm. you're actually. Um, distributing your presence more equally and getting out of a certain rut mm -hmm. that your mind gets stuck into when listening, mm -hmm. which seems less organic than the breath. Yeah. Right? So that makes a lot Absolutely. of sense. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and you're doing that through movement. So I'm curious, what kind of movements did people do? Tell me, someone lean in. You rock side to side. What else? I, I saw someone lots of took people. their arms over their head. I see. Yeah. Uh, Rocking side Barbara to side, doing that. moving side to side. So mm -hmm. gravity shifts, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Right. So, so what would be if you're about to practice pranayama at home or more focused breathing? and not doing it more vinyasan style through movement. Looks like some of you would do, practice some gravity shifts, right? Are you trying to activate your skin? What, what are the things you're trying to, trying to get to be part of your breathing? Because that would be getting the awareness to spread out through the system, right? Is way to get your whole body breathing. So I, I mean, I'm not criticizing here. I'm not saying, I'm not trying to lead you down a uh, a, a corridor and then a dark corridor and then push you down. I'm trying to say, let's look at your intuition. I saw people stretching and lifting their arms up, which I think would mean that they're opening their ribs and opening mm -hmm. their lungs. Makes <laughs> sense. So a little bit of action for sure before pranayama practice makes sense. It's interesting to just start to think about what you're trying to achieve with it. Just bringing awareness to your whole body, like head to toe, just having a full, a full amount of awareness. Like if I'm going to sit down and if I'm not going to practice, because like Jane, I would practice first and then do pranayama. But so so let, let's talk a little bit about that, about practicing first and then doing a little bit of pranayama. So... The advantage of that is your body's more woke up, right? And or something. Quiet. Blood's and flowing there, right? Like, what about <clears throat> fatigue? Is, I mean, in, in a good way, is fatigue part of what the body presence is? Well, quiet, as maybe, I mean, fatigue one way, but I think just quiet, there's a quietness that happens in your body. There's an ability to, to sit still and and rest like there's a one 
you know, there's like a sense of like, I've, I've now kind of seen my whole body and now we can all rest. <laughs> now yeah. Which, which is part of the equal distribution of presence, right? Or the humming that you might feel after class. Yeah. Right. I mean, again, I mean, I think, I don't think there's one way to do this. Right. Like, like I, I think there's a lot of ways. So that makes sense. And in a way that gets back to what Jane is saying about, about getting your mind quieter in a way, when you say that quiet place, right. You also mean that your mind's just like being able to land better into your body. Which is if, if you were going to do it before a practice or without a practice like that, getting quiet and then just letting yourself let your mind let your mind sink into your body would be you know the other way to do it i think yeah so do you in most meditation classes that you've taken for example this would be me being an interlocutor now right kind of a little bit of a gadfly in most meditation class do you do a lot of asana before you meditate no Right. So now that doesn't mean that you're talking about is wrong. It means that there's another path of methodology that doesn't have, that doesn't have, you know, one of the limbs being meditation. You typically don't meditate after working your body really hard. Right. It feels and good after you do. <laughs> it does though, doesn't it? Because then it, I mean, but, but again, Let's assume that there isn't an implicit criticism all the time. There's trying to understand the different methodologies of trying to help the practitioner learn, right? So, and, and, and I think with, with you and me, I mean, you and me being the whole class, I think there's something really important about moving some but before you, before you breathe, before you try to practice anyone. So, um, Barbara, you have your hand up. Don't worry. We'll actually get to some, see, I think pranayama classes are really, really hard. Right. And so if you get three or four good breaths in one class, you hit a home run in my opinion. Right. Like I think it's really hard to get a good breath, a really integrated breath. All right. So Barbara, you have your hand up. So what it's a little hard to put in words, but like the what I was doing was in one way or another stretching. And for me, that seems to create spaciousness internally. And it's the spaciousness that somehow brings me together as opposed to having my mind acting upon myself in a certain way. I don't know if that makes any sense. I think and, it totally makes sense. And like if I'm if I'm feeling really wiped out and sore or just like stretching doesn't feel good, sometimes I just imagine. I love to start meditation by imagining vast space, like either the ocean, which is a happy place for me, or the beautiful photos of deep outer space from the web telescope. Mm -hmm. And there's just something about taking in that spaciousness that creates a different relation with myself, or that brings me together yeah. with myself, I think. So I think that that's a really interesting thing. And I think hope people can like think about that. I like I like the phrase um spaciousness brings me together as opposed to spaciousness um disassociating for people and that's very relevant to me because i had a lot of trauma in my early life and spent a lot of my life dissociated from my body yeah. this is part of my uh amends to my body and my my coming back to my deep self. So I'm so thrilled to be here. And I've spent so much of my life contracted both emotionally and then physically that um, spaciousness just is like an antidote for me. It just, it brings something in 
that's so much bigger and deeper and beyond all of that, that I can just float in. As you talk about effortless effort or whatever, like Mm -hmm. there's an effortlessness in spaciousness for my body personally, from my life experience. Yeah. And so like, that's a really important insight. So, so how do you get the body to participate most of, so Jennifer and, uh, we we can uh, your name always gets me whacked. Lita. Lita, yeah. Okay, so let's look. At, you mind if we use you as an example? You, you, Absolutely. You or don't okay, mind. so 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 how do you get the body to participate? So Jennifer lives with pretty far along MS, right? She's I used to work with her in person all the time. Um, so. If she takes, if she tries to take whatever breath she has now pretty deeply, right? Um, it's can you can you get imagine from her posture, it's gonna get stuck a little bit in certain places. Right. You can kind of see that. Like even if you were to go up and turn your head really far, really slouch down, you'd have to be more violent with whatever breath you have in order to actually get it to fill the whole vessel as effortlessly. So Lita, if you like help straighten Jennifer's head just a little bit. So now I want you all to try to feel this, right? Right, like in your bones right now. Right, so Jennifer right away, you know, you can tell something's right because the top of her mouth starts to smile a little bit and her mouth starts to open, right? So now if you let her head go back again, to where it would go, but Jennifer's not going to want to put it that way. Look, she's she wants to keep it upright, right? So let it go back a little bit more, Jennifer, right? Right? So that breath is going to be different. You can start to feel the shadows coming into her body, right? Right? And now Lita's going to help her straighten out. So as she helps her head straighten out, so, so now use your... Switch hands. So put your left hand, Lita, on her right shoulder. Yep, and hold her. No, the left shoulder. Pardon me. Right, and spread that out a little bit. Right, right. There you go. And then support her head. Right, but keep your hand, your hand on her other shoulder, and hold her head. Yep. I see your intuition is the other way, but I may, that makes sense. So now instead with, with the hand on her shoulder, put one thumb right on, on her trapezius and the other underneath her ear like this. You see what I'm doing here? Right. So just try to keep her feeling that space, right? That space between her shoulder and her ear. There you go. Right, so Jennifer's getting it from empty space now. Remember that spaciousness, right? That I was talking about, that that Barbara was talking about. So we're just trying to get her that, right? So I can tell you now, now go to put your hand, now as she's got that, don't hold her head anymore and put your hand on her other shoulder. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's where you, you feel the contracture there. So you want that to be more open, right? Which you're not wrong. So now we're getting, okay, so now, so now Jennifer takes some inhalation and exhalation from this body position and more of her body's breathing, right? So to take her off of focus here. So, yeah. So what does that mean in your body? So what would you do in your body? So one of them is, is, is moving around a little bit. So move around. And what I like too, a little bit of what you're doing, not only were you getting your rib cage to get, to make your mind know that your ribs are there, right? Your mind know that your ribs are there. That makes sense. Cause these are gonna get nudged by the inhalation and exhalation. But when you get more pliable between your intercostal muscles, right? and especially the bottom floating rib, it opens the door 
it's the gatekeeper to the rest of your body, the diaphragm. Remember we talked about the diaphragm last week. So you get your ribs kind of more felt, right? But that's supposed to be a doorway. That's not the end point. So as you get your rib cage feeling more pliable, so on this next inhalation that nudges your rib cage, can the inhalation show you where your legs are? Does it help if you know where your tailbone is? So now everybody do something wrong. I like learning from what's wrong, but it's violent when you start to see what's right and then you do something wrong. You start to realize it's a form of violence. Try to drop your sternum. Now notice the difference in the quality of sensation when you try to breathe into your ribs. Way more constricted, right? So how do you get effortless effort to become effortful effort to become effortless? Right? Well, and we just went through that with Jennifer and her posture with her head. Right? Because you could see, right, by the when she was getting more straightened, you could see that her breath was going to go through more of her body. Right? So, right? So obviously a lifted chest is part of the effortful effort becoming effortless. Right? Part of the, the inner consciousness spreading through the body comes without effort too. So let's just go back over the back of our chair a few times. So this is where the class without, like I, I might do pranayama, if I'm really working on pranayama, I might do a really light practice, really light to do and achieve what, what Jane <clears throat> is talking about. But part of what Barbara was talking about was that after you get open a little bit, she feels more spacious, which brings her together more, right? So this lifted chest, right, is part of what's spreading awareness effortlessly through more of your limbs, through more of your body. Now, if you can, like I can't do it, but I could imagine why I'd want to wiggle my toes. I can imagine a whole bunch of stuff. I, I could imagine wanting to feel more of my skin, right? I would want all these things. Like for me, when I start opening the skin on my hands, that for me is a doorway into a whole bunch of other awareness of skin. And it's also an awareness of the center of my chest. I've been trying to show you that for weeks now, for months, right? So you're doing all these things and I know that basically I want my spine to receive the magic of my breath. So in preparation, I'm not, I'm not just going to do gravity shifts, which spreads my awareness some, right? But I'm going to do things with my spine so it becomes a better receiver. All these things, right, are like what, what Jane wanted to do, trying to wake up up create the spaciousness that knits your awareness back together without a disassociation right so you're trying to get all these things because you want if i i agree with you if i go right from a dead sleep into pranayama i don't feel like i'm in my body enough right so we're trying to prepare okay so now one of the things I was trying to say last week was that the sensation of earth keeps the mind calm, right? <clears throat> so one of the things that I've come to believe for me in a pranayama practice while sitting, that, that lifting the sternum and dropping the chin tends to make me overgrip my diaphragm that's counterproductive for my breath. So I tend to lean forward, but however you want to get more earth and more stability, I want stability to be one of the receivers of the prana, right? So however you can get, whether it's in your chair, whether it's this, what I was trying to say last week was that this feeling of, I also want my pranayama when I'm seated to actually have an, an a lit and awake spine. So I want to hit down through my sitting bones and lift my sternum a little bit. 
right? So I'm forward here, feeling my forearms on my thighs, connecting to the earth, extending my spine, broadening across my collarbones, broadening across my sacrum to create not just the feeling of openness on my skin, like when I stretched my ribs, I'm trying to get the inner corridor open in preparation for pranayama because I'm going to want a feeling of extension in my spine, but I don't want the extension to be too active, right? <clears throat> so that's part of why the spine getting a little active, but gracefully and, and passively is why when you're laying flat in pranayama laying down, you typically have something, you have your chest lifted on a bolster. You don't want to, you wouldn't want to do pranayama in an active back bend. Right, too much effort is gonna like strain the breath. Okay, and so, so find your position where you feel enough earth, enough awakeness. Find how to keep the space lit, knitting you together, whatever position that is for you today. A lot of times I like doing seated pranayama if I'm on a mat with my legs wide. I like to do it in upavista kanasana, right? But here I'm going to do it differently. Remember one of the things I was trying to say last week was that was that different breaths for different body positions. So find how you want to be. Now, and hopefully you've done whatever you needed to do to feel a little more lit. So there's more effortless effort becoming effortless. Your spine, not just your mind, is distributing presence throughout your body. That's why your chest is lifted. That's why you have earth. That's why you've got conditions of safety and stability. You're trying to take advantage of effortful effort becoming effortless. So when you've got whatever position that's going to be, now actively start to realize why Shavasana would be one of the, the prerequisites of a good pranayama practice. So start to soften around the temples, the jaw, the inside of your mouth. Now, the reason why I do this leaning forward, like um, Jane, is because if I sit back, I tend to collapse and compress in my low back, which affects the distribution of my breath. Right, but everybody's different, right? So you're trying to get let go. And I remember I was trying to say about making space between the skin on your face and your cheekbones, making space between your shoulders and your elbows, getting back to what Barbara's insight was. The spaciousness and being in space gracefully is going to help distribute the prana, which is going to be more directly activated by the inhalation and the exhalation. So I'm going inward. So the breath can more directly interact with my core. So if, if breathing through your mouth and your nose is not so easy, it's fine if you breathe through your nose, your mouth. But if you can recognize the quality change between breathing through your nose and breathing through your mouth. They're different. Now, ex inhale through your nose and exhale through your mouth and notice the difference. Notice that to take it to a far extreme, that people lifting weights are going to exhale through their mouth. There's something about that in action. And it's calming, it's surrendering. But now stay more inward and inhale and exhale. If you can, if not, just do it through your mouth. Inhale and exhale through your nose. Do you notice that when you exhale through your nose, it extends your spine more?
And then the next inhale goes into a more expansive sensation, extended sensation of your spine. So action is not going to be right on, right around here when you're breathing in and out through your nose. But the inward extension to the limbs. It's more apparent. So in this vessel that's got inner and outer sensation of gravity, Try to let your breath touch all of it. Allow it to touch everything. Even if you can't feel it touch everything. And let the breath Brush out. Be more aware on this next exhalation of it returning to what surrounds you. Notice if you're pressing your tongue into the roof of your mouth. Stay deep, stay hollow. Make sure you're including your scalp, your ears, your sitting bones, your heels. Keep aware of the whole, W-H-O-L-E. Watch, observe the inhale and the exhale. Try to slightly lengthen the exhalation. Let the exhalation also ex extend your spine. So the inhalation expands you. Exhalation extends your midline. Now, after a recovery breath, I want you to start your inhalation more from between your inner knees. Stay connected there, start the inhalation in, up, and through. And then exhale all the way back through. So your breath is being used to cleanse. Expand and cleanse. Take a recovery breath. Take a couple. Ooh. 
repose a little bit if you have to. Then come back. So the techniques and the different breaths are going to start introducing more fluctuation into the breath pattern. So exhale all the way out. And then on this next inhalation after I'm done talking, inhale about a third of the way. Pause. Inhale the next third of the way. So you're going from base up. Pause. Inhale the final third. Try not to push hard at the very top. And then let it all wash out. So it's so now instead of the breath just having one bottom and one top, it's got three stops and starts. Try it again. Take a recovery breath. Try it again. Notice if you're clenching your jaw. If you've forgotten to be in the space you're in, if your tongue is pressing in the roof of your mouth, prepare for two more breaths as best you can. Take a recovery breath and then inhale a third of the way. Second third top third. As you let it wash out, grow your spine. One more. And then back to normal breathing. Except nothing's normal. And then just let your chair hold you up. Because there's a good chance you gripped in places that you didn't even know. I know I do. So the, the violence possible in deeper pranayama is amplified. 
So you really got to try to let the world hold, hold you up for a second. And you just try to, because you did go through your own breathing patterns and kept breathing down the same ruts because that's part of the practice, right? So you're really trying to let it spread out now. Let the water be boundaryless and the world hold you up. Refine the softening of the temples and the jaw on the inside of your mouth. Start to bring yourself back slightly deeper inhalation, slightly longer exhalation. When you're ready, open your eyes. If you want to close them again, close them again. And open them again. So not that I want to brag about Jennifer and Lita, but Oh, look how much different she's sitting. Look at the change. Right? Look at the effortlessness that's now more in, in herself. It's so easy to forget. And if you don't think that you're not Jennifer... It's just not as obvious. You've got another thing coming. Right? Like, honestly, I've got my own version of Jennifer. The places, the ruts, the things I forget. All this, all the stuff, right? Like, that's just part of what it is to inhabit um well i hope you got a couple of lots of words lots of words right but i hope you got a couple of good breaths or at least you saw how much is potentially going on and also i like moving and breathing more than being breathing that focus can you see why they might say pranayama is super confrontive. Right? You get way into that. That's why I also, when I come out of, a, and I didn't want to keep you there too long because it's intense for me, right? When I do it, like when I come out of a couple of good breaths, don't you feel like when you come back, you've traveled a great distance back? Like, what the hell? How do you get that far away? Right. Well, that far away is with you every single breath. Right. It's not that you got somewhere. It's that you realize the dimension of your breath. That is way, way in there. Now, what's scary is that or not, what's great about practice is you don't have to always, and maybe some of the, this practice was too short and didn't work for you, right? But you don't always have to be intimidated by the vastness. I hope, although it's kind of intense, I hope party smiles at the vastness. Goes, holy cow, I've been taking a lot for granted. I don't want to live where pranayama takes me, just so you know. That is not a place I want to live. I want to get better and better at knowing that it's there. Right? All the time. But I don't have to go there. I want it to be 
folded up into my practice. I want it to get drafted up into my life, not me having to go there and be confronted with the depth of it. It's too much. It's too much for me. So I smile and go there once in a while and go, holy cow. Right? And I'm grateful for it. All right, everybody. Thanks for sticking with that. I spent two times on that trying to get you to realize or get try to share with you the vastness of the field and the role that the body plays and, and how you decide to set up your own more focused breathing practice is up to you, right? But just know there's a lot of ways in and there's a lot of ways out, right? All right, everybody, namaste.